You're sleeping, you're sleeping. You're sleeping. One of the subjects of greatest interest to overlanders and off-roaders alike is the subject of off-road mobility. Now there's plenty of information out there on the internet, but unfortunately most of it is purely observational. Comments like, well I put on the wider tyres and found I could climb those sand dunes. It may or may not have been the wider tyres that enable him to do that. Now as an engineer, I like to know what's going on and why it's going on. And in this context, very fortunate that we do have the tools available. There's a branch of engineering called Terra Mechanics, and I'm going to use this to look into this subject. The field of Terra Mechanics was largely created through the efforts of one very gifted Polish engineer, Professor M.G. Becker, who was at the University of Michigan. He published his seminal work, The Theory of Land Locomotion, in 1955, followed by another two reference works. I'm pleased to say that his first book was recently republished as a reprint. After leaving academic life, he became a leading contributor to the Apollo Moon Buggy program, and I can't think of a much more mission-critical off-road application. His work was taken on by a former collaborator of his, Professor Joe Wong, who has published two leading textbooks in this field. It's through the inspiration of these two individuals that I'm doing this video now. Now I can't just jump in at the deep end and look at, for example, the behaviour of one of the latest 4x4s with a highly sophisticated traction control system. That's way beyond what I'll be able to do. So I've got to make some simplifications. And the first one, instead of looking at a complete vehicle, I'll look at the behaviour of one wheel in isolation. And secondly, I'm firstly going to look at unpowered wheels, which are what you'd have on a tow trailer or the undriven wheels on a two-wheel drive vehicle. And the reasons for this are obvious. Firstly, it makes the theory a great deal easier and more tractable. But secondly, if you're looking at the case of driven wheels, there's simply so many parameters and variables at play that it's very difficult to understand what's really going on. So let's look at the case of unpowered wheels first, and having mastered that, I will come back to looking at powered wheels in a subsequent video. Now when looking at the behaviour of an individual wheel, there's only two parts to the system. On the one side you've got the tar, on the other side you've got the ground or the soil. And importantly, it's the interaction between the two which controls everything. So let's start by having a look at the underlying behaviour of each of these, starting with the soil. Now the field of soil mechanics has been around for, I guess, a couple of hundred years. It's very well established. And it's a major part of civil engineering. It's a good starting point to understand what's really going on. Now to simplify things down to the very basic level, there are essentially two different types of soils. We've got the cohesive soils, as typified by the clays, and we've got the granular materials, typified by the sands and the gravels. And as you see, they behave in a very different way. Many other soils are just some sort of mix of these two. We'll go to the computer now and I'll show you what the difference is between these two soil types and why they behave the way that they do. Now there are different classification systems to enable you to decide what type of soil you're dealing with. The simplest by far are those based purely on the particle sizes. And in this table we've got four different classification bodies and along the top we've got different uh, sorts of soils. For all of the bodies, the clays are characterised by having particles less than 2 microns in diameter. We come out through the silts to the sands, and sands are in the range 2 millimetres to 60 microns, and the gravels are greater than 2 millimetre particle size. Now when soils are overloaded to the point of failure, they don't actually fail in compression, they tend to fail in shear. We have here a very famous foundation failure, and this was a grain silo in the northern United States. 
it overloaded the soil and it failed along one side. Whilst it may not be evident, what has actually happened is that as the foundation has moved down, it has displaced the soil as bodily blocks and this has slid along the line to maximum shear and we have a pile up of soil which appears above the surface. In this case the foundation is uh, symmetrically loaded whereas in the case of the grain silos it was the silos along one side which were loaded and hence it failed on that side first. And you see it here we got the surplus soil which has been displaced and has appeared at the surface exactly as, as per the theory. Now the shear strength of any soil may be calculated using this very well established equation called the Moore Coulomb equation and it may be applied either to a cohesive soil or to a granular material or to any combination of the two. And he says that the shear strength uh, comprises contribution from the cohesive material and this term is called the undrained shear strength and also the granular material so we've got the normal external pressure applied to the soil times the tan of the internal angle of friction. Clay is a very particular structure. You've got the tiny particles which are in fact crystalline either tetrahedral or octahedral depending on the composition. You've also got pore water which is always present and can only be driven off by superheating the clay. And all of this is bound together by very strong but short range electrostatic forces. And this gives clay its unique cohesive property. The interparticular forces between the crystals of clay materials are of very short range and they don't extend to the sorts of distances you get between the particles of granular materials. However, these are in physical contact with each other and when any external pressure is applied, they will tend to interlock. But this is very heavily dependent on the shape of the particles, ranging from the angular particles right through to the well-rounded particles. So it's the application of external pressure which gives granular materials their strength and this may be expressed as an angle of internal friction. I've introduced the concept of cohesive and granular soils. Before I part on, I'd just like to explain a little bit more. Cohesive soils have this unique property whereby they stick together, but also stick to other materials like steel here, and importantly in our case, sticks to rubber too. And even when they appear to be dry, they retain their cohesion and the pore water is inside tightly adhered to the mineral crystals. And all of this is unaffected by any external pressure. By contrast, granular materials have no inherent strength at all. Everything depends on this property, the internal angle of friction. And if you want to visualise it, look at a natural pile of the material like say a sand dune and the slope of the pile would be very similar to the angle of friction you'd measure in a lab test. Everything depends on the external pressure. So if we take a bag of sand and if I could seal this against water ingress, drop it into the sea to say 50 meters water depth and this would become hard as concrete. And this is how we can drive over sand. The tire presses down the soil gains uh, shear strength in accordance with the Coulomb equation I showed you and hence it can support the weight of the vehicle. Well that's all I propose to say about soil mechanics for today and if you stuck with it that far you've done very well. I'll now look at the behaviour of the tyres and in particular the contact patch and after that we can use terra mechanics to study the interaction between the tyre and the soil and to gain an understanding of off-road mobility. There are various papers which have been published which document the size of the contact patch for various inflation pressures and tyre loads. I've taken one such typical paper by a Romanian researcher called Christian Minka. It shows the key features and it serves our purposes very well. He uses quite a small tyre, a 165R13, 
and for different inflation pressures he varies the applied load. Now this is for a high inflation pressure just on three bars and the load varies from quite a low value 0.2 of a ton up to nearly 0.45 of a ton. And you see that at the low load value the contact patch is almost elliptical and at the high load value it's a rectangle with rounded corners. For all of the cases we're going to consider we will be in this regime. We've now reduced the inflation pressure to about 2 bars and again we've increased the tyre loading from about 0.2 tonnes to just under 0.45 tonnes. And as the load increases the width of the contact patch does indeed go up but by around 10% however the length goes up by in this case almost 50% and this effect is even more pronounced when we reduce inflation pressure to 1.2 bars which is very typical of roading tyre pressure. Now to illustrate the effect of changing the tyre pressure rather than changing the wheel load I plotted the two contact patches side by side so these are the contact patches at 2 bar and these are the contact patches at 1.2 bars and if we compare the curves like for like so the inner curve here has a tyre load of 0.2 tonnes and likewise here we see that actually the width of the contact patches hardly varies with the inflation pressure whereas the length goes up by just over 40%. I think this illustrates the underlying behaviour very neatly. The next question is, what is the contact pressure under the tread of the tar? A widely used approximation is that the contact pressure is equal to the inflation pressure inside and that may well be valid in the centre of the contact patch here. However, as we can see, there are membrane forces in the wall of the tyre which are likely to have an effect. So is this approximation valid or isn't it? Well, the answer is that the assumption does hold good but only over a limited range of values. I show here a set of curves taken from Wong's book. In this case, there are 12.5 centrifive R20, quite a big tyre. And we're plotting the contact pressures on the vertical axis against the inflation pressures on the horizontal axis and this is for a, w a range of wheel loads going up from 1 tonne up to 2.5 tonnes and anything lying on this diagonal line implies a quality so the assumption holds good in this range here but as we go to lower inflation pressures we find that the contact pressures um, are correspondingly greater and the reason for this is quite simple it's a load which is carried by the tyre carcass and the converse effect applies at higher inflation pressures but also for any given inflation pressure as the wheel load goes up the contact pressure increases likewise so the assumption that the contact pressure equals the inflation pressure isn't generally valid and we've got to make the appropriate adjustments. For the purposes of the analyses, which I'll be performing later, I've digitised the contact pressure curves, both from Wong's book and from any other references I could find. So we have here a typical surface, and we show the variation contact pressure with the wheel loads and with the inflation pressure. I wish I had these curves for every tyre of interest. Unfortunately, I don't. So when I do the analyses, I'll just have to take the curves for the nearest matching tyre. Well, that's it for today. We've done the groundwork and we've set the scene. And in the next video, which will follow shortly, we'll look at how unpowered wheels behave off-road under various conditions of different tyres, soil types, wheel loads, inflation pressures, all of the sorts of things we have to consider every time we go off-road. See you soon.